excited to be here with you guys tonight. This is my first time in TLR. This is amazing. I have not seen you guys here in the auditorium. So if this is your first time tonight, you're not alone. You're in good company. This is a first night for me too. For those who don't know me in the room, like Samer said, my name is Chelsea. I get to work on staff here at Woodstock City, which is so much fun. I'm excited to be hanging out with you guys tonight, but I typically get to work with high school students, which as you can imagine, is a lot of fun, but can be a lot of drama. It's a lot of reward and it's a lot of crazy. Um, I know some of you in the room get to do that with me. Are there any, any small group leaders or people who are involved with Inside Out in the room? Raise your hand. Yeah, that's right. These people are rock stars. These people make the world go round. Um, so I get to work with high school students, but Inside Out for me actually started when I was a high school student. I was a high school student at Brownsburg Church in Inside Out. And then after that, I went to the University of Georgia to get my degree. I graduated in 2016. Go dogs! if there's any dog fans in the crowd. Yeah. I went to the University of Georgia, graduated in 2016. And then pretty soon after, I married my high school sweetheart, which I know is kind of an anomaly. Um, his name is Ty. He's the best. He's in the room somewhere in here. Um, and we don't have any children yet because that sounds very scary to me in this season. Like, I am not responsible to take care of myself, let alone someone else. But we do have a fur baby, which is like equally a child. So this is my little family. I think we have a photo. This is my husband, Ty. This is my fur baby, Spanky. Um, if you think that's a weird name, just pause. Is anybody familiar with the movie, The Little Rascals? It's a classic, it's so good. So in Little Rascals, there's a, a little boy named Stanky McFarlane, and that is my dog's namesake. We love him, he acts like a baby, so I feel like we're good for a season. Like I can, he doesn't cry, he doesn't wear diapers, and he is like super cuddly, so he's a great in-between. But that is me, I, I know that you guys have something really special going on here on Wednesday nights. I wish I would have had something like this when I was in college. I went to Athens Church when I was at UGA, but we didn't have something specifically for just people in my season of life. So I'm really excited that we get to hang out together tonight. I hope you have fun. I know I'm gonna have fun. We're just gonna have a conversation. But I want something to look a little different tonight than what you usually experience. Is anybody in the room, show of hands, who likes to journal? Is anybody a journaler? Yep. Is anybody like, I hate the idea of journaling? That would be my husband. Yep, there are definitely some of you in the room. So I love to journal. I use my journal for a lot of different reasons. Um, I like to record what's going on in my life in my journal. I like to record what I'm learning. I like to process what I'm thinking through. And sometimes I even put my prayers in my journal. So tonight, I wanna challenge everybody in the room to kind of dip their toes into the idea of journaling. You don't have to, I'm not telling you to go home and buy a journal if you don't have one, you don't have to do that. But as you walked in, you all got a little piece of paper and a pen, hopefully something to write with. And before we jump into our conversation, I want you to give this a try. I want you to just get some thoughts out onto paper and maybe start processing what we're gonna talk about. So you're gonna be tempted with this question to answer it with one word. I'm gonna challenge you, please don't do that. You don't have to write a novel. You don't have to have great punctuation. We're not collecting these at the end, so you're not gonna get a grade. But I just want you to take whatever comes to mind with this question and get it out on your paper. Does that sound cool? Amazing. So this is what I want you to process real quick for about a minute. When someone asks, how are you doing? How do you usually respond and why? Take about a minute and just keep your pen moving. Amazing. Some of you are still writing. That's amazing. You really took that to heart. You kept your pen moving. Um, I want you to continue that thought in just a minute. But, but I know for me, when I think about this question, I find that I ask other people this question a lot. I am a feeler, I'm a super intuitive person, 
So when I walk into a room, I automatically am feeling out, is there any tension in the room? Is anybody sad? Is anybody upset? Is anybody angry? So I am quick to say, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? Are we good? Are you good? That is just a knee-jerk response for me. But I also find that I ask this question as less of a question and more of a greeting. Maybe for you, that's what you wrote about. I find that when I'm walking in the hall and I see someone coming at me, my polite way of saying hello is, hey, how are you? And, and I bet 99% of the time the answer is, good, how are you? And we just keep on moving. Nobody even answers the second, how are you, right? Like, we all just have this hello that is really a question. I never really expect anyone to tell me how they're really doing. I'm just saying it in passing. And so when people ask me this question, I assume that's what they're looking for. I assume they don't actually want to really know how I'm doing. I assume that they don't want me to really gauge what's going on inside. And so I, I just say, I'm good, thanks, how are you? And I keep moving on with my day. But I know this is true for me and maybe it's true for you. There are days when I am having a really bad day. And, and someone comes to me and says, hey, Charles, how are you doing? And I'm like, well, you know, on the outside, I am good. I am totally fine. But on the inside, I'm thinking, well, if I'm being honest, this is the worst day I've had in a really long time. And as soon as you walk away, I'm probably gonna go in the bathroom and cry. And um, I am a really ugly crier, so I don't wanna freak you out, don't worry. And I didn't wear waterproof mascara today, so Lord knows I am not about to cry this off, so I'm good. Right, maybe you've done this before. Ladies, you know the moment of, oh shoot, I have something later, I can't cry this makeup off, so I'm good, I'm fine. On the inside, not good. On the outside, I'm good. We all do this, right? We've all had that moment where what you said on the outside was totally disconnected to what you were feeling on the inside. I don't think I'm alone in that. I think it's a common problem. And so as I started to wrestle with why do we do this? Why do I do this? I realized it's because I'm afraid. I'm afraid that if I'm honest with how I'm doing, it might change the way that, that someone thinks about me or, or feels about me. And I don't know if you guys are Enneagram people, but I'm an Enneagram too which means my core desire is to be loved, okay? I love to be loved, and so the thought of someone not loving me or the thought of me being honest, changing how they feel about me is really scary. I'm afraid that if I'm honest with how I'm doing, that, that maybe what's said in confidence will be betrayed, that maybe someone will go and share something I didn't mean to be shared We've had this happen, right? Maybe you've had it in a friendship or a relationship. I'm afraid that if I'm honest with how I'm doing, someone might see me as weak, and you might be thinking at me, looking at me, thinking, you don't look super strong, Chelsea. And that's fine, that's where you're wrong. I went to a body pump class this morning, so I am so strong, I cannot stand the thought of people thinking I'm weak, not just physically, because I will totally arm wrestle you if I have to, but also emotionally and mentally. I'm afraid, if I'm honest with the people around me, that if I say something out loud that I've been feeling on the inside for a long time, that it might hurt me more, that it might cause more pain. And I don't like pain. Who likes pain? I'm like, can we just have sunshine and rainbows all the time? I don't want pain. There's a lot of fears that come with being honest with how we're doing. And those are all valid fears because the reality is being honest with how we're doing, it's vulnerable and it takes time. It, it takes more than two seconds. And you do have to be brave and honest. And so what I'm learning 
is that the more often that we're not honest with the people around us, the more often we struggle to be honest with ourselves. I have to ask the question, am I even being honest with myself right now? Am I being honest with me about how me is doing on the inside? Because I know I can go days and weeks and months and sometimes even years without talking about how I'm doing, without thinking about how I'm doing, without processing how I'm doing. Maybe you do this too. I know for me, I do this thing where I start to convince myself that I'm fine. I'm not just saying it on the outside anymore. I'm trying to convince myself on the inside. I'm like looking myself in the mirror, giving myself a pep talk. If anybody watches The Bachelor in the room, any Bachelor fans? Yeah, I knew I would get you on that one. Yeah, me and my husband, we love The Bachelor. Um, so I don't recommend dating like The Bachelor, but I like watching The Bachelor. So anyways, back on track. I do this thing where I give myself a pep talk in the mirror. And this is like McKenna leaving The Bachelor a couple of weeks ago. She's like in the car like, you are strong and you are worthy and you will not let a man define you. That is me in the mirror every day. I'm like, Chelsea, uh uh, nope, you're sad, it's fine. You are strong. You're angry, it's fine. You are joyful. You are a delight to be around. Girl, get it together. We do this, and there's some good to that. We should pep ourselves up a little bit, but here's the issue. Here's where it becomes a problem. It's when we start to stuff it down to the bottom, where we say, no, 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 I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna acknowledge that emotion because I never wanna deal with it. Or, or when we take the emotion out and we say, I'm gonna put it on like a bookshelf over here, like way up high, so I never have to see it again, so I never have to think about it again, so I never have to deal with it. We convince ourselves that if we stuff it down or, or we put it on the bookshelf, that maybe we'll never have to feel it. You see, this is what I know that we all do with our emotions. We stuff, we minimize, we ignore. And, and I'm convinced that there might be a better way, that in fact, this might not be the healthiest option for us. I imagine that some of you are doing this right now. I imagine that a lot of you did this today, or this week, or this month. Maybe for you, you're walking through a really hard breakup. And, and rather than deal with the pain or the rejection and the hurt, you just jumped right on a dating app, or you jumped into the next relationship, and, and you thought, I'll just, I'll just step into the next fling, so I don't have to think about the last one. Maybe for you, there's a big decision on the horizon. Maybe graduation is coming. Maybe life is about to change in a radical way. Maybe you feel like everyone around you has their life figured out. And you're like, what am I gonna do? You have no clue. Maybe that's you, and, and rather than dealing with the overwhelm or the fear or the anxiety, you just fill up your calendar so that you never have a moment to be alone, so that you never have to deal with what you're feeling, Maybe for you, you are walking through some trauma. Maybe you just experienced some trauma. Maybe someone that you're close to has got a really scary diagnosis. And, and when the thought bubbles up in your mind of that thing that is really horrifying, you just say, I'm not even, I'm not even gonna think about it. I'm just gonna change my thought. I'm not even gonna go there. And you stuff it down. Maybe for you, you've been single for a really long time. Maybe you've been single forever. And rather than deal with the feeling of loneliness or disappointment, 
You just make jokes about it to your friends. You cover up your pain with humor. We all do this. We're all guilty of it. And, and I'm convinced that it's not the healthiest way, that it's not the best way. I'm convinced that there's another way. In fact, there's this story that Jesus told during his time here on earth that I think gives us a glimpse into another option. You see, Jesus tells this story, a parable, about a guy who's in a season that's really similar to maybe some of you. This guy is, is at the end of, of being a kid. He's stepping into adulthood. He's getting his independence. He's getting to choose his own life. And he makes a really big decision that lands him in a place where he has a hard time being honest with how he's doing. This is the story of the prodigal son. Maybe you've heard it before. Maybe you've never heard it. But if you've heard it before, I don't want you to tune it out because I think we can take a different look. You see, the prodigal son's story, it starts off with this father. This father has two sons, a younger son and an older son. And this father is setting aside an inheritance for each son, okay? So essentially, he's trying to set his sons up to have a good life for whenever he's no longer here on earth. Maybe some of you have an inheritance you're expecting. Maybe you've gotten an inheritance before. I do not have one. My family is broke as a joke, so I will not be getting one of those. But this father, he has an inheritance for his sons. It, maybe it's some money and, and some land and probably some livestock at that time. And the younger son, he comes to the father and he says, hey, listen, I know that I'm supposed to wait until you die to get the money, but I don't want to wait that long. So like, can you just give it to me now? Like, can you imagine the sass of that? What? It's so dishonoring. It's so disrespectful. He's essentially saying, hey, I know that eventually I could cash in on your life insurance policy, but I would rather, like, I'm not worried about you. I just want the money, so can we, like, hurry up this thing and I'll take it now? And, and the father, which blows my mind, he says, okay, you can have half of it. Go ahead. And so the son who is just disrespected and dishonored his father in a massive way, he, he takes his inheritance and he's about to head off into adulthood where he can make all his own decisions, where he's independent, living his own life. And that's where our story picks up. Jesus tells them not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, that inheritance, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living, wild living. That's up for two interpretation. Let's just say like Vegas and he's going all out. It's like the hangover, okay? So he squandered his wealth in wild living. It goes on, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So this son, he starts off in this luxurious lifestyle. He's like, I got it all, I got it made, I can do what I want, I can go where I want. He's living it up in Vegas, Lord knows what he's doing. He starts off, in a, and in his mind, in a really great position. But not long after, the tables turn and he finds himself in desperate need. He is so needy that he's willing to hire himself out to feed pigs. And, and within this context, the Jews believed that pigs were like the grossest animal. They believed them to be unclean. And so the fact that he has this job tells us as the reader that he is on the bottom rung of the social ladder. 
He has fallen from the top to the bottom and he's desperate. But not only is he feeding the pigs, the text tells us he wants to eat what they're eating. And I don't know about you, but I've never been super enticed by the thought of pig food. I have a dog, you saw my dog Spanky. I never wake up in the morning and look at his food like, oh, that looks good, let me give it a shot. Like this guy is so desperate. He'll do anything he can just to survive. And for the first time, and maybe a long time, because we don't know how long it took him to spend all of his inheritance, for the first time, the younger son finds himself in a position where he has to be honest with himself, where he can no longer pretend that everything's okay, where he can't stuff his emotions, where he finally has to realize something's off here. The text goes on. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. But here's where I wanna hang out, okay? These six words, when he came to his senses. This is that moment where it's like, oh, shoot but it's not shoot, you know what I'm saying? It is like that moment where you're like, how did I get here? What is happening? What have I done? Maybe you've had this moment recently. It is that moment where it's a wake up call and suddenly something has gotta change. It is the moment where you realize, okay, maybe everything's not okay. Maybe everything's not fine. Maybe everything's not great. If I'm being honest, and I wanna be honest because I'm talking about being honest, that's important. If I'm being honest, I had this moment myself a couple months ago. I uh, am in a crazy season of life. I just bought a house about a month, two months ago. And then right after I bought a house, um, my mechanic called about a week later and said, oh, you're gonna have to buy a new car. And I thought, well, that ain't gonna work. (laughs) And so my finances are like tumbling down around me. And, And if I'm honest, I had this big dream for 2020. I thought a big life change was on the horizon. And it turned out it wasn't. And so I walked into 2020 with a lot of disappointment and discontentment and bitterness. And then my job gets insane. And then my husband's job gets insane. And it's like we're ships passing in the night. It just feels like our world is tumbling around us. And so I'm waking up every morning for months feeling afraid and overwhelmed and discontent and really sad, feeling like I'm not enough, like I can't keep up, like I can't even breathe. But at the same time, I wake up every morning and I do that McKenna pep talk. I'm like, Chelsea, we don't have time. You can't be sad. You can't be angry. You can't be scared. You just gotta keep going because life is too crazy and you just gotta keep up, so push those emotions to the side, forget about them, you don't have time. And then, I think, I wanna take a hot yoga class. Anybody done hot yoga in the room? Hot yoga, yeah, yeah. Any guys done hot yoga, you wanna raise your hand? I respect the heck out of that. I, when I see guys in hot yoga, I'm like, yes, this is so cool. So I decide in the middle of the chaos, I'm gonna go take a hot yoga class. And if you're not familiar with hot yoga, it's essentially yoga, but it's really hot. And I am a very sweaty person. So in normal yoga, I'm already sweaty. In hot yoga, I am real, real sweaty. And so I'm in this yoga studio for the first time. The instructor says, is anyone new to yoga today? And I'm like, no, not me. I've done this before. I know what I'm doing. 
So I don't raise my hand. So she just goes on with business as usual, of course. And I am like, what is happening in this room? There are so many bizarre things I've never seen before, I've never heard before. People are rubbing essential oils all over their face. They're making crazy noises. Everyone's breathing real heavy. And I'm like, I'm not trying to get the flu. Can y'all please stop breathing so heavy? It is, she's like, everybody take your flow, chaturanga. I'm like, what are they doing in here? And I'm not joking. I'm just like, one eye open, one eye closed. Like, okay, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? And so finally, we get to the end of this session. And she says, okay, I want everybody to, to take your comfortable seat. So we all sit down. And she says, okay, you're going to reach up to your strong mountain and bring your palms to heart center. And I'm like, oh, gosh. What am I doing in this room? I'm pretty convinced at this point that I've joined a cult. I'm not sure. <laughs> and I'm like, Does this, is, is it okay that I'm in here? I work for a church. I don't know. So she's like, set your intention for this practice. I'm like, okay, what are my intentions? And then she looks around and she says, okay, we are all going to take three ohms. And I'm like, I got a bad feeling about this. I don't know what an ohm is, but I don't think I'm gonna like it. And sure enough, everyone in the room starts going, ohm. And now I am like, I gotta get the heck out of Dodge. Y'all, I'm looking around like, oh no, oh no. I, what have I done? I'm in it now. But at the end of our ohms, and I did participate in the ohms. I love the ohms now. At the end of our ohms, she says, everyone lay down on the floor, put your palms, hands up, and find your resting place. And, and in a room full of strangers who are really freaking me out, I find that there are tears streaming down my face because 2020 has been really freaking hard and this hot yoga class has made me realize that I have been stuffing my emotions for weeks and months and, and even though I wanted to pretend that everything was fine, for the first time in a hot yoga class, as I'm weeping, I realize I am not okay. I'm not Okay, this was my come to my senses moment. You see, what happened to me in a hot yoga studio is the same thing that happened to the prodigal son in a pig pen. We came to our senses. For the first time, we had to be honest with the reality that what's going on inside cannot be minimized or stuffed or ignored anymore. And, and what I learned that day in that room and what I'm continuing to learn as the months go on is that when we reject feeling, we refuse healing. When we reject feeling, we refuse healing. I imagine some of you have learned this the hard way. I imagine some of you have had that moment where you're in a group of friends and someone says something that triggers an emotion for you, and you find yourself trying to find the nearest exit because you're like, I just gotta get out of here. I gotta go, I'm about to cry, and I don't wanna cry in front of these people. I imagine for some of you, today is the day that you need to say out loud for yourself or to somebody that you trust that you are not okay. Today is the day that you need to be honest with yourself and admit you're not okay. You get a choice, an active choice, to reject feeling, to keep pretending, to keep pushing it down, or you get an active choice to walk toward healing, 
to speak it out loud, to be honest with that thing that's in you, with that emotion that maybe is bubbling to the surface right now. You see, you might be thinking, Chelsea, Lord have mercy, you just sound moody. You might be thinking that crying in a yoga class or wanting to eat pig's food is an overreaction, that we're just super emotional. But what I know is that emotions like this, that moments like this where we have to admit we're not okay, they're just the outcome of unprocessed emotions. They're the byproduct of pain that we have not allowed ourselves to feel. And here's what, here's what I know, here's what you know. Emotions aren't bad. Emotions are necessary. Emotions are important. Emotions are meant to be felt, to be processed. When we process our emotions, we learn to control them. When we process our emotions, we learn to control them. But here's the catch. When we don't process them, they will start to control us. And then we start to feel out of control. Unprocessed emotions are where sin and harm start to creep in. Because when we feel out of control, we will do anything we can to grasp at any form or fashion of control. And this is where we find ourselves in trouble. This is why we love, we're glued to the dating apps, because we're in control. You get to choose the narrative, you get to choose who you swipe on, you control the situation. This is why we turn to substances, because we can control how we feel in a really unhealthy way, but it still controls our emotions. This is why we act out sexually. This is why some people turn to pornography, because you can control the environment. You see, when we haven't processed our emotions, we start to control in ways that aren't helpful, that in fact are really harmful. And so we've got to figure out how do we unlock this peace? How do we walk into the mess, be honest with ourselves, and process the emotion that we've been avoiding for years, or months, or maybe just a few days? For me in college, I walked in with some trauma in my final years of high school that that I just decided I wasn't gonna process in that season. So when I got to college, I had a lot of undealt with emotions. And for me, the easiest way to avoid those emotions, to grasp at control, was to drink. For me, when that trauma bubbled to the surface, I thought, I'm just gonna take a few shots and I'll forget about it. I'll have fun. I won't have to feel any of that sadness. For me, when I felt anxious or afraid, I thought, bottle of wine. I'll feel good after that. I'll forget all about this anxiety, this fear. When I felt lonely, I would just drink until I didn't feel lonely anymore. And that's not healthy. There are all of these things that we grasp at control for. That, that push us away from healing when, when all along we could have been walking toward it. When we reject feeling, we refuse healing. That prodigal son, he did that same thing. He tried to gain control. He landed himself in a sticky situation. And when he finally came to his senses, he felt shame and guilt and regret, and he realized this isn't working out. So he came to his senses, he turned around, and he went back home. He went home. And he's horrified as he goes home that his father will not receive him. He's horrified that, that in order to go home, he's gonna have to become a servant. 
He's coming up with a speech. And he comes to his house and his father sees him far off in the distance and he comes running after his son because he's just so glad that he came to his senses and came home. He's just so excited to see his son. He embraces him, he forgives him, he comforts him and he covers him in extravagant love. And for you tonight, maybe that's your story. Maybe your father, your heavenly father is just waiting. Maybe he's waiting patiently for you to come to your senses, for you to turn around and come home. Because I know what's true is you have a father who wants nothing more in the world for you than for you to be healed. He wants you to feel that thing so that he can start to heal that thing. And he's the only one who can do it. We can't heal ourselves. There's not a 10-step process. But what you can do tonight, right now in this room, what you can do is create space for healing to come. You can lean in and be honest with that father who wants to heal you. So what is it for you tonight? What is the emotion that you've been stuffing, that you've been minimizing, that you've been ignoring for a long time? What is that emotion that bubbles to the surface of your mind that, that you're really afraid to say out loud and that you can't even imagine admitting to someone else? What is that emotion that's holding you back from healing? Because you won't deal with it. I wanna close this in a journal tonight, just the way that we started. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to lean in to that feeling. I bet you, you are already feeling that emotion come up and you're like, oh, mm, mm, nope, I don't wanna feel that. But I want you to be courageous. I want you to be honest because God is saying, come on, let's do this tonight. Let's start this healing process right here I know all your thoughts. I know your desires and your dreams. I know your regrets. And I'm not afraid of any of it. I love you. I want relationship with you. So come on, be honest with me. Open up to me. Give me a chance at healing you from the inside out. He does that for us. You just have to create the space. So I'm gonna ask you another question. And again, I want you to keep your pen moving. Don't shy away. Don't worry about someone looking at your paper. We're not taking these up. This is just you and God. This is your moment. Do whatever you need to do. Feel whatever you need to feel. The band is gonna come back up but I want you to go there because I wish that I had a lot sooner than I did. And I imagine for somebody in this room right now, healing is coming. And I'm excited about it. So here's what I want you to process. Which emotion has shown up in your life the most in the past few months. And if you don't know, if you can't put words around it, that's okay. The first step in this process of healing is identifying the emotion. You all got an emotion wheel as you walked in. So if you need to, just start there. Start somewhere. Lean in, be honest with the Father who loves you who's excited for you to come to your senses and come home.